She is the U.S. representative for Minnesota's 5th Congressional District and the author of This Is What America Looks Like, My Journey from Refugee to Congresswoman. Please welcome Congresswoman Ilan Omar. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, it's great to be here with you. Thank you for having me. So I want to talk about the book, but I want to start with this news about the eviction moratorium. So the moratorium went into effect in September and the Supreme Court threw it to Congress. Uh, And it seems like the CDC acted and came up with this uh, high levels, but 90 percent of the country rule because uh, the deadline came, Congress didn't act. And all of a sudden, everybody decided to care about it all at once and say somebody else has to do this. Uh, it, It does seem as though Democrats uh didn't make this a big issue until the last minute maybe in part because there was no hope of getting it through uh with the republican votes you'd need in the senate but at the same time all of a sudden it felt like everybody was saying somebody do something uh what happened there yeah i think for a long time we were expecting um the the administration to to deal with it right uh you know we sent out a letter um we kept asking And it wasn't until like the day before um, uh, that we were to adjourn uh, in in Congress that the White House came out and said, well, our hands are tied and now it's up to Congress to to do this with legislation. And at first, you know, all of us were like, okay, we, we can do this. And, you know, Chairwoman Waters was drafting legislation. A lot of us were um, being called to have conversations with with colleagues. And I thought that we would at least extend um, our time there and not go to to recess uh, so that we could get this done, right? Uh, And I was shocked Friday as we were all waiting to see um, what was gonna happen that instead of continuing to whip the votes and have conversations, and trying to find a middle ground where everybody can be happy. Because I, I, I do believe, and I've had conversations with senators, that there was a path there. And, and obviously, even with the moderates in um, Congress, there was a path. And so when leadership decided that we should um, recess and uh, do you know, ask for unanimous consent, which we knew that, you know, that that really was a way to avoid um, responsibility for for the legislation. Uh, And when we heard some of our colleagues were leaving town and they weren't even willing to leave their proxy votes so that people, you know, um, can can vote on their behalf because of the pandemic, we have that option now. And uh, we realized that, you know, people were not actually taking this seriously, that they were willing to allow the eviction moratorium to lapse uh, and risk 11 million people um, being evicted in, in our country. And, you know, as you know, Corey has her own personal story um, with being yeah. unhoused. Um, I have a, a, a severe um, level of... Um, understanding of what it means to be to be unhoused Uh, and Ayana does as well and so the three of us decided that we were going to spend the night on the steps until our colleagues came back uh, to take action or the the senators did so um, or the White House and you know it eventually came down to the White House saying oh yeah yeah we we we, there was a way (laughs) Um, there's something that we can do but we know that this is just a temporary fix at this moment, right? We have to find a permanent solution. And there are two things we're working on right now. One is to try to put pressure on local municipalities and states to get the billions of dollars we sent to them out um, to renters and landlords, because you know it's, it's not just renters that are um, suffering here, right? It's also landlords that need to make their mortgages. That, that, that have to have the resources as well. Um, and then secondly, is to try to figure out when we can come back to, to do a more permanent uh, solution, to deal with it in a more permanent way. Right, I mean, there has this, been this strange aspect to the even at times bipartisan recognition that we need government to step in and help people in crisis. If you lose your job and you're evicted during a pandemic, People, this, there's a collective understanding that this is not everybody's fault. Like this just happened to you and you shouldn't lose your home. But if you lose your job 
and you get evicted and it happens to not be at a time when that's a shared experience at the levels that we've seen, suddenly the same concern is gone, but it looks exact, it looks the same for you. It's the same economic crisis for you. Like a, a person, that's, that's your recession, that's your economic crisis. Is this changing how people think about what government needs to do to help people when we aren't in a global pandemic, a once in a century kind of crisis? Unfortunately, I don't, I don't think it is. Uh, because we're still struggling to make people understand how devastating it is to evict people during a pandemic, right? We're asking people to stay in their homes to be safe, and we're not willing to protect them and make sure that they actually have a home <laughs> to stay in. Um, and so, you know, to to think about that outside of this this crisis um, is is a huge leap for a lot of of our colleagues. Many of our municipalities and states don't have tenant protection laws um, on, on the books. I know that you know my former colleagues in the Minnesota House have been working on um, some, some pieces of, of legislation uh, and um, the Minneapolis City Council uh, is now putting a ballot measure um, on, on the ballot to strengthen the, the kind of protections um, that renters have in, in our city. Uh, so there are, I suppose, it's not, you know, all is not lost. There are folks in some pockets um, of, of our communities that are thinking about this, but they're, they're being met with a lot of um, uh, assistance, right? Um, and a yeah, lot yeah. of assistance. Uh, we have a housing task force. Um, the, uh, my office leads a housing task force um, and we have you know, members from all of the municipalities that I represent um, that are elected. We have advocates, we've got um, lawyers, we have uh, state um, elected leaders that, that serve on, on this task force. And all of us, every single time we meet, spend a you know, significant amount of time uh, trying to make sure that the, the laws that are on the books right now are actually being followed and implemented and then try to think about what are other things that, that we can do. I, I introduced my Homes for All legislation to try to help to make sure that there's enough housing for people to be housed. Um, and during the pandemic, I introduced the Rent and Mortgage Cancellation Act, which actually would have been um, a simpler way to, to do this rent instead of the uh, to deal with this instead of the rental assistance path that we ended up uh, going with that we are seeing right now is riddled with problems. You know, it's been months, um, in some cases, almost a year and a half um, for some of that resource uh, to have had reached the people that it was intended to reach. Yeah, you know. Yeah, the, the very little of the money. I had something. What is it? Three billion out of forty-seven billion has actually gotten out to people. Can you imagine? Uh, that? <laughs> well, I, it's this. It, it does seem that like there is this larger issue, which is that like okay, you know, Democrats, progressives, we want to invest in infrastructure. We want to show people the government can work. We want to show people that there is a way in which we can build a, a social safety net, a a, a a a social democracy that that you know gives people a chance in life that protects them when when they face the, the the bad luck and misfortune that hits everybody. And then you see something like this and you see the money not going out the door. You see like even in liberal places in the country, the inability to kind of build things, uh, 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 address houselessness, address all of these issues. Like it does seem at a certain point, like, yes, we need the federal government to, to spend the money, but it does seem to be there, ne there needs to be some kind of conversation even among progressives about how to make government actually work. Yeah, um, and, and that, that is a conversation that a lot of people are um, avoiding and, and not having, right? Uh, we, we are actively writing um, basically the, the headlines of why none of these things should be implemented. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> which is sort of counterproductive to, to what we want to happen, right? We want right. to have these programs implemented um, in, in ways that is encouraging um, and in ways that would actually increase support for, for these programs. But it seems like, you know, 
we we make them so complicated that they are always riddled with with problems if you if you think about how our school infrastructure our public school infrastructures are run if you think about just our you know public housing infrastructures are run anything that has to do with government that should be that should have the resources to to be done in uh, a very simple easy way is done in the most complicated way and it takes forever for people to get the resources that they need that was intended for them um, to get and we do end up spending a lot of money on administrative cost um, and you know uh, there's there just seems to be a lot a lot of waste. I know we're starting to sound like Republicans at this moment. No, no but it's <laughs> but not because. <laughs> but it is it is very frustrating. I mean, I you know I was just reading a, a letter that the um, New York um, congressional delegation sent to um, the the governor to try to make sure these resources are getting to to people. Uh, my office is drafting one right now to get our congregation to sign on. Um, uh, so that we can send it to our governor. I mean, this is not what we should be spending our our energy and time um, in in doing, and we shouldn't be doing this when we have right uh, people who we know have the the tools and support these programs um, who are just not doing it the right way. So much of how government is administered is sort of there's like decades and decades of fear of waste, fear of the wrong people getting the money, fear of somebody getting money they don't deserve, fear of people taking advantage of the system, the welfare queens in the 80s, and all of that has led to this like Byzantine system where the government doesn't work. And we, but, but, but like, it's been encouraging in the wake of this sort of economic crisis where it's, whether it's sort of the, um, uh, 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 the child credit that was, a, that was more universal or even just the vaccine, like you don't need to bring your insurance card. You just walk in and you get the vaccine. You don't need to go through some complicated step. I think to that point, I, I want to say, you know, it is, um, I, I, I think we have to recognize too that the, the, the people who are administering this, these programs um, seem to not understand that there is urgency in getting these resources out, right? Uh, and, you know, I often say it's it's always important to have people who have fluency in the struggles of people in these positions, whether they're elected or, you know, working for, for the government. Um, because I, I believe if we had, you know, people who are running this rental assistance program who truly understood how urgent it is for the people to have these resources, then these uh, processes would have been streamlined. There are places where there, there's 22 page <laughs> application process. Um, you know, some of them are not uh, bilingual in, in, they're not translated so people can't access them. It's just, it's too complicated for people to get something when they desperately need it. And when you have the added stress um, of worrying about whether you you have enough resources to stay in your home to feed your children, you know, to protect yourself from a uh, a pandemic. Um, the last thing that you are able to to do is deal with a process that requires you to fill out twenty two pages, and you know, find, dig out yeah. all kinds of proof um, when it, it it should be evident that you desperately need these resources and the intent from con um, congressional leaders was for you to actually have it, not for these people to hold it um, and take forever in getting you the money that you need. So you talked about the need for elected, to elected officials and, and government officials to draw on their own experience. And, and, and so let's, let's talk about the, the book. Uh, you talked about getting money from your dad in exchange for good grades so that you could buy outfits. Uh, what would you, what was the difference between an A outfit and like a C outfit? So uh, quarterly, um, I would, if I had a straight A's, I would get $300 um, uh, that, I, that I could use to, to buy um, uh, clothes. <laughs> um, and I mean, and that included everything, right? Like everything that you would put on. Um, and so 300 doesn't really go far. Uh, so I desperately wanted to earn, 
the grades the 300 yeah 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 if you don't get 300 then you're kind of um effed in that way and so <laughs> I, I if I, if i got if i had one b um mm -hmm. in in my you know grades for like seven whatever six classes i would take every quarter uh i would get 200 and wow that's a there, tough fall yeah and if there was a c i would get 100 and then after that there was no money all right. How what what was the typical so a C, number? A C minus even meant like there was no there was nothing. No so there that no that, that meant for six months I would not have you know and like I I couldn't I couldn't buy like no trip to oh, Aeropostale for you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no pops, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and you no, certainly didn't want to be the only kid in the family who who that was happening to. So <laughs> he 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 felt like he worked really hard for um, his money and. Uh, you know, we had we had one job, and that yeah. that job was to to make sure that you know in the future we didn't work as hard as he had to to earn money, and so um, educate getting an education um, was a huge part of that. I feel like you got A's. I feel like you got three hundred fairly often. I did. I did. I'm very competitive, so yeah, I, I don't. I also, did, I also didn't want to deal with my siblings. <laughs> so you also. Uh talk about a comparison between you and Britney Spears uh, that in around 20, 2007, that, that there was an elopement, there was a shaving of the head, <laughs> there was chaos. And you said, I needed to invest in who I wanted to become. Uh, what, what did that look like? What was that, what was that change like? Yeah, um, I, I, th I think for, you know, I, I was um, in, in many ways, a rebellion kid who deeply cared about the way her dad felt um, and, you know, what level of stress I, I was putting on, on my father. And so even though I kind of wanted to live life on my own terms, um, I always worried about what I, you know, everything that I did and everything I said, how, that was impacting my father and i and i i i think i had um a meltdown <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. a crisis an early uh life crisis an early midlife crisis um and it 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 pushed me to kind of examine you know whether i was living the life that i wanted for myself or i was living the life that i thought um, my father would would appreciate and approve. Um, and once I started to really make drastic changes in my life to to worry about my own happiness and um, and live life on my terms, it turned out that my father ultimately that's all he wanted. And um, it was my assumptions of what I thought would make him happy or cause him less stress. Uh, that were driving me insane. I would say the moral of the story is, you know, you're you're oftentimes thinking you're doing something for for other people, and that's what they need from you. But oftentimes they just need you to be your full self and live as authentically as you could. And that's if they love you, that's what truly makes them happy. One thing you talk about in the book is the challenge of being a a Muslim and all of the assumptions and bigotry that 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 is uh, used to interpret virtually everything you say, the kind of, the challenge of knowing how your words will be interpreted and how, and how much of a, um, uh, how much attention is on everything you say. You said one of the most toxic, it is in the book, one of the most toxic misperceptions of my faith is that because I'm a Muslim, I hate Israel and the Jewish people. Although that couldn't be further from reality, whenever I criticize Israel, it is filtered through this lens. And I see how, over and over again, there is a cottage industry that exists to take what you say, put it in the worst possible light, take it out of context, use it to say that you hate Israel, that you hate Jewish people, that you hate Muslims. But at the same time, in the book, you you talk about how there have been moments where you've issued statements that played into tropes and you've apologized and tried to kind of uh, uh, understand the issue better, approach the issue a little bit differently. How does that impact that that scrutiny how does that impact uh how you talk about this issue and how do you think your way of discussing it has changed as you've kind of 
both been kind of hit with uh, brutal misinformation propaganda, but also adjusted uh, in the wake of moments where you've you know genuinely apologized. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know it's it's also like the just outside of the the Muslimness. I think there's a lot of assumptions that people make about what I know or should know. <laughs> um, and, you know, there, there are, um, I think, tropes that are out there, obviously, that, that are, you know, part of um, the, the cultural discourse that a lot of people or conversations that a lot of people will have that, that I, I wasn't raised with, so I'm not aware of them. And oftentimes when you are in, in those spaces, you know, people will not stop to say, did you even know that this, <laughs> you know, this, this thing that you say, and I, I think, you know, I, I've noticed that in, um, in many cases, if you, if you have an assumption about who the person is, if you have an assumption about the way they were raised, what their, their faith and their culture, you know, whatever assumption that you might have about a person that you're interacting with, whether it is, you know, someone in a relationship or what, whatever um, the, the situation might be, you filter everything they say through that assumption. And you oftentimes don't stop to say, to, you know, ask yourself whether the assumptions that you are making are rooted in something that you feel about them or they're rooted in something that they actually feel about you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 I I am learning that right, um, and continue to learn that uh, that it is important um, for me to familiarize myself um, and to learn the the different language um, that that is necessary um, to use in in this conversation. That what. I believe is a, a normal thing that you can say might be very loaded um, yeah. in, in some ways. Um, and, you know, and, and it's something I think I am familiar with because it, it happens to me <laughs> in, in, in almost every way, not just with um, the, the Israel discourse, but, you know, today I was, I was reading a meme um, that is in uh, um, like the, it's in the Saudi Tribune, um, like their, like the Chicago Tribune, like their newspaper. And it said, um, it, it's, it's drawing on this assumption that if you criticize Saudi Arabia, you must be allied with like their, you know, their adversaries, right? So I'm, I'm allied with Iran. And so they were saying my rap mm -hmm. <laughs> is worn like the, the mullah. Right, okay. <laughs> and so, so this is the way that I signal my allegiance or something. Yeah. And, um, and, and it is, it's, you know, it's a widely read uh, paper. And so I know that, you know, for the next couple of days, like I will be attacked um, uh, on on social media by Saudi bots um, and and people uh, who who will use that that narrative because it's it's a shorthand, right? Regardless of whatever I say from Saudi Arabia about Saudi Arabia, it will be like oh, because the Iranians put her <laughs> up to it, um, and it happens to me in in Somali conversations if I say something about you know, any region, it's like, oh, because you're this clan, that's why you hate this region. You know, you, you said something positive about this region, it's because, you, you know, your dad comes from it. Um, so regardless of what I say, there's always an assumption about my identity, my background that must influence it. I genuinely cannot <laughs> um, have, you know, a, a political ideology or principles or values that are not rooted in some weird um, stereotypes that people have of the identities that I carry. Yeah, you know, I remember when you came, we, we, we did a show in, it must have been Minneapolis, uh, and you were on our live show, and it was the first time we had met, and uh, 
I always think about it, and I even I'll think about it after this conversation is reminded me of it, which is that uh, you have become a lightning rod in so many ways, um, and someone who people approach through assumptions and, and, and misinformation and kind of kind of scorch earth politics. But interacting with you, you're you're so always so kind and nice and just like mild mannered and soft spoken. You are not this kind of the, you you are nothing like any of the versions of the caricature that you have been subjected to. Um, as you think about that, I how do you kind of deal with that on a daily basis? You know, this is this book is you telling your kind of human story as you as a full fledged person, but social media, cable news, it flattens everybody. It flattens everything. How do you deal with that? How do you kind of move through the world when you know there are so many people trying to kind of flatten you to two dimensions? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think for me, it's it's important to not allow people's opinions to define um, my opinions about myself, right? Um, and, you know, I, I, I grew up, which I, I talk a lot about the book in, um, in a family and in a community in, in, in a society where, um, you know, I, I, I was never enough of a thing, <laughs> right? Like I was, I wasn't girl enough. I wasn't, um, you know, Muslim enough. I wasn't, um, Somali enough because my mom's not ethnically Somali. Like there was, you know, and I'm also not Yemeni enough, right? Because my father is Somali. So like it, I was always in in a space where people had opinions of who I was supposed to be and what I was supposed to do that was very contrary to who I actually was and what I believed I was supposed to be and do. Um, and so I, I think dealing with this for me is, is like a, a natural extension um, of what I've always dealt with. It is hard, I, I think, to deal with the, the sort of vitriol that comes because of it now, right? The, the death threats and having um, to send people to, to jail because of it and to constantly worry about the safety of my kids and myself and to have family um, be distant, distanced from me because you know I don't I don't I don't want to to jeopardize um, their their safety. So all of that is um, challenging. But I, I am someone who's overcome a lot of things, and I you know think I will overcome this. Congressman Elon Omar, thank you so much uh, uh, for coming on today. It was so good to talk to you. Yeah, you should come back to Minneapolis. When when are we, we want you again? Would love to come. Listen, not all I I the. I need to, there needs to be an audience. Otherwise I get weirder and weirder because I don't get the <laughs> negative feedback. Without the negative feedback of an audience telling me I'm going too far, I'm just becoming more and more strange and eccentric. So it's an yeah. emergency for me. So yeah. I would love to come back. All right, we should we should work something out. Gotta work it out. <laughs> so good to talk to you. Thank you so much. That's it, bye.